Hello, everybody. Welcome to ETF Edge. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. We're your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. Our guest today, two of the very best in the business here, Gerard O'Reilly's co-CEO and CIO of Dimensional Fund Advisors, and my old friend Tom Lydon from ETF Trends. Gerard, I want to start with you. This is the first time we've had you on. Your firm is very well known to me for many years, so I'm very happy to have you on. Uh, before we get to the ETF business, uh, I want to wonder if you could just sort of describe to us, for people who aren't familiar with the Dimensional Fund philosophy, your approach to investing. I like to say it's sort of quantitative driven with an emphasis on keeping costs low, uh, but maybe that's too simple. Could you give us a brief overview of Dimensional Fund's investment philosophy? Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me on, and, and nice to speak with you and, and Tom today. Absolutely, be happy to give you a quick overview. In a nutshell, Dimensional's philosophy combines many of the unique aspects of indexing, low cost, transparent, low turnover, and so on, with an active implementation. And that's not too surprising, because when you look at David Booth or Mac McQuown, some of the folks that were involved with starting the firm, they actually started index funds back in the very early 70s, 1971. And over the past four decades, what we've been trying to do is improve upon indexing. And how we do that is through the research that we do, how we design portfolios, how we manage portfolios day to day, and then how we trade. So that's what I call active implementation, is taking some of the good aspects, whether it's quantitative investing, traditional active management, and combining them then with some of the good things from indexing, you know, low cost, broad diversification, uh, low turnover. So a lot of the aspects of quant, of traditional active, and of indexing all combined in what we think is a, a very, very a good package in terms of delivering higher expected returns, robust risk management to investors. Hey, well, Gerard, uh, Tom Lyden, if I can just the, jump in for a second. Um, Ahead, your, your philosophy and your business model over the years has been really unique in the fact that you hand-selected advisors and institutions as clients, even would bring them into your company to educate them on your philosophy and then approve them as far as being able to buy. Uh, I know there are a lot of advisors out there today that are really excited that you're getting into the ETF space, but that model that works so well for you over time to be able to remove the emotions of investors and keep a steady flow of new money that was coming in are you concerned at all about opening up your uh, investment tools to the general public? Thanks for that question, Tom. And you know, we're committed to working with financial professionals. As you mentioned, we've worked with large institutions, we've worked with financial advisors, we work with financial professionals, and we do a lot of educational type conferences and other types of support in that effort of working with financial professionals. We think that it's important before anybody invests with Dimensional that they understand what we're all about, how we approach investing, and what to expect from our uh, investment portfolios. We think that if you're well informed up front, there's fewer surprises when it comes to investing. We think that's very, very important and we're fully committed uh, to continuing to work with financial professionals going forward. When it comes to ETFs, this is kind of the intersection of two, what I would call very exciting uh, developments uh, in, in the industry, or one in the industry and one with our clients. In the industry, we had the ETF rule passed last September and that allows us to bring our kind of unique approach to investing active, transparent ETFs to the table. The second one, Tom, more directly to your question is, we've had a great relationship with the financial professionals that we work with, and they tell us what they want, and they tell us what they're interested in consuming from us, and they want that unique investment philosophy, but they want it in an ETF wrapper, and we've been hearing that now from the financial professionals that we work with for a couple of years. So this is kind of those two meeting where we can do something that we've been doing for a long time in mutual funds in an ETF space, and our clients are very, very excited about kind of having that come to the table. So you're planning to launch six new actively managed ETFs and also planning to convert uh, six tax managed mutual funds into these new ETFs. Is that right? And you've, two of them launched a couple of weeks ago on the New York Stock Exchange. Did I get that right? So, Bob, last June, we filed the preliminary registration statements for three actively managed ETFs that we were hoping to launch uh, this year. So two have launched. They launched in November, and we expect uh, the next one to list. Uh, we're targeting this coming Wednesday. So the two that launched was a U.S. all-cap core equity, a non-U.S. developed all-cap core equity, and then the emerging market is the one uh, to come. So that's what we're hoping to do uh, this year. They're all-cap. They buy large and small. And then the overweight, small cap, value, high profitability firms, all what we do 
uh, in our mutual fund lineup done with an active yeah. implementation. So we're doing a little bit of rebalancing every single day. The conversion then, so Bob, you, is we're uh, taking... Uh, yes, go on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, you finish your thought about you're converting. I think the key point here, the news I want to get to is you're you're converting from a mutual fund to an ETF space. And this is sort of big news. You're you're one of the first ones, if not the first one to be to be doing that. Uh, and, and that's sort of, the I think, the important news here. Right. Yeah, that's important news. I would say that we're among the first to launch under exclusively under the new ETF rule, rule 6C11. So that's news. And then this conversion of converting mutual funds to ETFs has not been done before in the industry. Now, these are tax managed mutual funds, which means in their investment objective, we talk about maximizing after tax returns and the impact of federal income taxes on uh, returns. So these are six tax managed funds, about 25 to 30 billion AUM, that then a couple of weeks ago, we uh, kind of announced our plans that we hope to convert those from mutual funds to ETFs right. over the course of 2021. So that's big news, big news indeed. Right. And, and can you just, for people who get confused about this all the time, I know this may be elementary, but it, can you explain how moving from a mutual fund wrapper here where you're actively managed to an ETF wrapper that is also actively managed is more tax efficient? How, how is it more tax efficient? I know it's an elementary question, but we have to do this basic education for people to, to make sure they fully understand what's going on here. Absolutely, Bob. And there's two main types of distributions that funds make. And an ETF, by the way, is a mutual fund. It's just a mutual fund under a slightly different wrapper. And one type of distribution is capital gains, and the other type of distribution is dividend income. So there's the two main types of distributions that funds make. When you look at our tax managed funds, as an example, the dividend income distribution can have two parts to it. One that's taxed at a higher level and one at a lower level, qualified versus non-qualified. So we've done a lot of work to make sure that 100% of the dividend income from those funds has been qualified dividend income. And that's unique to the funds. You don't see that as often in the ETF landscape. The other part is the capital gains distributions. And when it comes to ETFs, there's a particular mechanism that means that you generally realize the capital gain when you sell the ETF. The ETFs don't make that many in the way of capital gains distributions over the time that you hold the ETF. So we think that this tax managed conversion brings another tool, done this job of making sure that we're, we're getting 100% qualified dividend income from the fund that's taxed at a lower rate. And now this additional tool helps us manage the capital gains distributions so that you're as the investor, are more in control of when you realize those capital gain distributions. Great. Thank you for that. Let, let me just go back to the core uh, U.S. core equity fund, because if you could explain a little bit about what goes into it, because when you look at the top holdings, frankly, it looks like a, a, a you know, a, a large cap quality fund here. The, your top holdings are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet and, and, and Facebook. It doesn't get more, I'm using the word quality, uh, uh, than that. Uh, and, and, and yet you sort of have a broader definition of what you're using. What are you going for here? And, and, and you know, am I wrong in noting that this looks like big cap quality to me? So it's a all cap strategy. So if you look at the holdings and we publish the holdings now uh, with a one day lag, about 2,200, give or take, stocks in that portfolio. So very, very broadly diversified. That strategy is going to overweight the value stocks, lower relative price stocks. You were talking about that in your previous seg segment. Value had a pretty good month in November. And those stocks that have uh, are firms with higher profitability. So it's overweighting those stocks. If you look at the holdings uh, of, the, of the strategy, as you mentioned, uh, Bob, it's not deviating too far from the market. So we expect this to have low deviation from the overall market, but we expect to add value through slight overweights to value profitability, how we trade, how we rebalance on a daily basis. So I think your observations are spot on. The big names that you'll be familiar with in the marketplace are held inside this strategy, along with many thousands of other names, some small cap with an overweight to small value and high profitability. Yeah, Gerard, Let me just move it, on to the overall. In, go, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. So um, when, when you talk about value and the timing right now, being able to bring your unique strategies to market in the form of ETFs, uh, and we've got this relative valuation between growth and value that we haven't seen this dispersion since uh, 1999. And from 1999 to 2009, the performance that your funds had were really incredible. But the last 10 years have been a bit of a challenge. 
What's the outlook, would you say, for the next five years based on the markets today? Uh, money's cheap, low interest rates. A lot of people are concerned about the 60-40 allocation. Uh, and growth has really done real well, even though we've had to pay up for that. And especially coming out of the coronavirus and the optimism in cyclicals, might we still be challenged in the in the area of, of value? Or as Eugene Farmer always said, things revert back to the mean. Where do, where do you folks stand in that? So, Tom, that goes back to our overall investment philosophy. And that's, we think that prices contain a lot of information. Prices are our best forecast of the future. And we think that people demand differences in expected returns to hold different securities. So if I give you a microcap stock versus Apple, who are you going to demand a higher interest rate to loan money to? Probably the microcap stock. So we think those differences in expected returns are always there. Now, what happens in realization is sometimes something better than is expected happens, and you get a real positive value premium. Sometimes something worse than expected happens. But what we see from the historical data is that value is on average outperform growth. And in time periods when it outperforms, it outperforms by a lot. So when we look at next year and the year after and five years, we always expect a positive value premium because it's basically price is set to a level such that the return that investors demand equals the expected return. It's as straightforward as that. So we look for those stocks that have low prices relative to fundamentals, high expected future cash flows, that's with the profitability, overweight those stocks. So we think that it's always a good time for value. On your other comment about growth, you know, you look at Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, the, some of the companies that Bob mentioned, you look at those returns over the past 10 years, it's been 30% a year or so, a bit higher than 30% a year. That means that on average, the prices have doubled every two and a half years. If you think that's going to happen for the next 10 years, it may, but it's unlikely. Usually when stocks become the biggest stocks in the marketplace, they outperform the market by a lot to get there, but on average, they tend to yeah. underperform the market after they get there. And so that's this whole kind of notion of those larger stocks having lower expected returns. And that's what has generally uh, played out in, in, in the historical data. Yeah. The problem is the patience issue, uh, Gerard. Um, of course, mean reversion is real and it exists. And we all are in the same school as you are. I think Tom and I certainly are. Um, the problem is it's been 10 years, uh, for, for example, large cap outperformance on small cap uh, growth. Uh, over value. Um, that's a long time to wait. Uh, and there, there's the problem, of course, is that patience issue. And, and I know you believe it's always a good time for value. Let me just phrase this a little bit differently. Is there any fundamental reason why you think 2021 is going to be a good year for value? If nothing else, because of the vaccine coming, would that help value? Or it, 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 uh, am I asking too much here about if, if to give a more fundamental analysis of, of value in 2021 other than it's always a good time? You can look at some of the stocks, Bob, that are in a value portfolio now. And a value portfolio will tend to be overweight energy right now, financials right now, maybe some of the airline stocks and so on. And so when you look at the news that we had over the past month about three different possible vaccines coming to the marketplace, and the returns of those stocks in response to some of the news that we had over the course of November. I think that if you kind of have news like that, that on average will be good for those industries, the cyclical sectors that you mentioned uh, earlier on and in your show previously, uh, that can turn out to be uh, pretty good for, for value stocks. I always think, though, that prices do a good job of forecasting the future, the best job that we, that, that we, uh, that we can do. And so, to your other point, we expect value premiums every day. To Tom's point earlier on, he is correct in that the spread, if you look at price to book ratios or price to earnings ratios or price to cash flow ratios between value stocks and growth stocks is at an all time high here in the US. Uh, that doesn't have too much information about it, let's say what will happen to value over the course of the next year. Uh, but certainly the valuation ratios would say, well, growth is high relative to its historical average. Value is kind of where it's been relative to its historical average. So, you know, when you look at two asset categories and one has given you 30 percent uh, or 15 to 20 percent a year over the past decade, when traditionally it's given yeah. you eight to nine and the other one has given you what it's given you over the past 80 years, which one are you more worried about? Hey, Gerard, quick question. You, uh, you've been kind of in a de facto way involved in the ETF business for the past five years with the relationship with John Hancock as the sub advisor, a nice diversified group of uh, asset classes and sectors. Will you continue in that capacity going forward? 
Uh, we sure hope so. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with John Hancock going back over a decade, and we've sub-advised mutual funds and ETFs for them. Uh, so we sure hope to continue that relationship. Uh, I think that they've helped us and we've helped them uh, many times over the years. And, and so we, we definitely continue, uh, plan to continue with that relationship. <laughs>